tales for dark nights. The following program is a production of Chilling Entertainment and the creative team at Chilling Tales for Dark Nights and a proud member of the Simply Scary Podcast Network. Visit simplyscarypodcast.com to learn more about this and our other weekly storytelling programs and become a patron today to show your support and get instant access to our extensive archive of downloadable ad-free tales of terror. Thank you for listening and enjoy the show. The following program is intended for mature audiences and may contain strong language, adult themes, and content of a violent and sexual nature which may not be appropriate for everyone. Welcome, listener, to the horror hell. If it's the darkness you seek, you won't be disappointed. I'm your host, Jason Hill, and it's time for our appointment. In this place, there is no sun, and nightmares do come true. Here, instead of shadow falling, the shadows follow you. Consider getting comfortable before the air grows colder. Prepare yourself if you dare. Come, inch a little closer. If darkness is what you're after, seek no more your searches through. You haven't found the darkness, traveler. The darkness has found you. Tonight's episode of The Horror Hill features a continuation of the two-part tale begun on last week's program. If you're just joining us today, we encourage you to begin your journey into the abyss with Season 1, Episode 5. For those of you returning this week, hungry for more, we've got just what you're craving. If you're quite through chomping at the bit, let's strap on the old feed bag for a final course of grisly gastronomy that's mm, finger licking good. From author Brian Martinez, I give you part two and the conclusion of The Body Farm. I don't know who I can believe anymore, if anyone at all. My days have become a surreal series of events, and I find myself questioning everything that happens within them, even my own thoughts. After I checked myself out of the hospital, I caught a cab to my place, good old apartment 403, and proceeded to take the longest shower of my life. It was probably the greatest feeling I've ever known, with a close second going to the nap I took directly after. I passed out for a long time, that kind of deep, heavy sleep that feels like it will last the rest of your life. The only reason I woke up was because someone rang my doorbell. It turned out to be Detective Andrews. He saw by my face that I'd been sleeping and apologized for not being able to call before he came over. I still have to remember to buy a new phone when I get a chance. We took the short drive to the shore in the detective's car without saying much. I double-checked that we wouldn't be going to the island alone, and he assured me several other detectives would be meeting us on the pier. First, he said he wanted to bring me to the boat launch, in case it jogged my memory. I also suspected it was to see how the boat owner reacted to my presence, but... We were both in for a surprise when we stepped inside the small launch office. The guy behind the counter was young. Not at all what I'd described in my writings. He turned out to be the launch's new owner. 
He explained to us that the old owner, Willis, had sold it to him for dirt cheap, which is how it changed hands so quickly. He had no information about Willis's whereabouts, but he did know that the old man had sold the business after the boat captain, who was apparently his brother, had urged him to. He said they seemed pretty nervous about something. Maybe it was something they saw, I told Andrews. He nodded, but he didn't say anything. Before we left, I asked if Willis had left anything behind. A cell phone, maybe? But the young guy said he hadn't found anything. We got back in the detective's car and drove a few minutes to a different pier, where two more detectives met us by a boat on one of the docks. One was blonde and named Detective Cooper. The other had red hair and a mustache and was called Detective Bennett. They didn't seem familiar to me at all, which offered me a weird kind of relief. I asked to see their badges, which they showed me, and they seemed amused when I studied them closely. My New Year's resolution is to be less trusting, I offered. Neither of them laughed. But I asked where the rest of the cops were, and they explained that they were already out on the island. We all got in the boat and headed over. Cooper was at the wheel. The weather was nice. One of those first days of spring that made the winter feel like a bad dream. But at the back of my mind, nagging me, was a voice of dread. It couldn't believe I was going back to that damn island. As much as I bitch and complain about it whenever I'm given the chance to return to Twain Island, for whatever reason, I always take it. Maybe there's something about it that calls to me. I don't know. Meanwhile, the detectives were having quiet conversations about me, just under the sound of the motor and the slapping of the boat against the ocean. And when I leaned in closer, they stopped talking. As we came close to the island, I felt a ball form in my stomach and a sharp pain in my temples. I noticed there weren't any boats tied to the dock. Just calm down, Andrews told me. They'll be here. You promised me a buttload of cops, I said. The police have cases other than yours. Now just relax. The three of us are more than capable of keeping you safe. I argued about it a bit more, but in the end, there was nothing to talk about. We were already at the island and it was too late to turn around. I told them I decided to stay on the boat until they got back. Detective Cooper took the keys with him as he got out of the boat. Bennett pointed out that I'd be alone if I stayed behind. I did not like his tone. Like some adult threatening a kid with the boogeyman. Andrews was the most understanding. He said he understood my hesitation, and normally they wouldn't expect a victim to return to the scene of an incident. But... As it stood, I was both the only witness and the only evidence they had. Without my help, whatever had happened on that island would stay a mystery for good. And that meant whoever had attacked me would go free while I lived in fear. He had a good point. The first stop we made was the guard's office. As we came up the small hill and I saw the state of the building, I felt immediate validation. The door had clearly been smashed in, half of it dangling on its frame and the other half spread in shards across the floor. The detectives stepped inside first. After a second of hesitation, I followed. There was a very strong smell in the air that I couldn't exactly place. The scene was how I described it. The desk and table on their sides where they'd been used to barricade the door. But the computer I'd used to type all those entries was missing, along with the broken two-way radio in the other room. When I asked the detectives if they'd been removed as evidence, they said neither of those items had been found. Then I guess someone must have done a little cleanup before the cops arrived. I said. That was when I realized what the smell was. Bleach. 
Someone did a thorough job of scrubbing this island, Detective Bennett said. He said whoever it was had missed a few drops of blood, and he pointed to the spot where they'd been found, high up on the far wall. It had to have been a brutal attack for any amount of blood to make it up that far. I asked if the blood had been tested to see who it belonged to, and he said they were still waiting for the lab results. I've got a funny feeling it's mine, I said. At least some of it, he replied. I noticed him exchange an uncomfortable glance with the other men, like he'd said too much already. Suddenly it hit me. Was I a suspect? From their perspective, I was the guy who'd been found bloody and high, with stories of strange lights and disappearing corpses. A single white male, recently unemployed. My God, did I fit the bill. But did they really think I'd go back there if I was responsible for what happened? Then again, the criminal supposedly always returns to the scene of the crime. If the guard's office was cleaned out, the main research facility made it look like Exhibit A in comparison. Every box, every machine, every instrument had completely disappeared from the building. Neatly packed up and taken away in the time since I'd been there. My memories from the island were still spotty at best, but I had distinct images in my mind of what those places had looked and felt like and what I was seeing did not match up. Where before it had been an active place of research, what we stood in now was a shell, a hollow building on a silent island. Somehow it had become even eerier without the boxes full of dead bones and skulls. Lonelier. Maybe. From there we began to walk around the island. The detectives let me take the lead, not walking in front, mind you, just pointing the direction we should go, and I did my best to guess and feel my way from body site to body site. At each one, we found only the telltale patches of flattened dead grass which marked where a body had been laid out. A few of them reminded me of snow angels. Not even the wire cages which had held most of the bodies were left behind, and I was more and more amazed about the complete thoroughness of the cleanup job. As I stood there holding my nauseous stomach, I saw someone move between the trees. Plain as day, it was a human figure in the forest, in the distance. I shouted out to the detectives, but from their angle they couldn't see him. I was fed up with the whole situation. I don't care how crazy it sounds, but I ran full speed into the forest, chasing the man I'd seen in the distance. The detectives followed after me as I weaved between the trees, yelling for the stranger to stop. Only once I caught another glimpse of him, but then he was gone. Disappeared, just past a grouping of trees. No matter how fast I ran, I could not catch him again. And eventually the detective shouted for me to stop. They looked for footprints in the dirt, but found only mine. Not one of them had seen him, and I couldn't tell if they believed me or they were just humoring me. The description I gave them of the man was vague, and I decided to keep it that way. In the boat again, heading back to shore, I caught a glimpse of a birthmark on Detective Andrew's neck, just behind his ear. It sounds strange, but... The sight of it sent the biggest sense of deja vu up my spine, and I knew in that moment that I hadn't recognized him from the hospital, that I had to have met him sometime before that. So, what happened to the other officers? I asked. The ones who were supposed to meet us out here? Cooper shouted over the noise of the motor. We had to get you out to the island somehow. After we got to shore, Cooper and Bennett went their own way and Andrews dropped me off back at my apartment. Before he could pull away, I leaned back in and asked which precinct he and the other detectives worked for. 31st, he said. I was quiet a second. 
You're full of shit, aren't you? Without responding, he put the car into drive and pulled away. I should have written down his plate number, but I didn't think of it until it was too late. When I got inside, I looked up the 31st precinct and called them up using my neighbor's phone. Not surprisingly, no one by those names works for the police. And the more I think about it, the more I recognize the stranger I saw out on the island. I'd gotten a better look at him than I'd let on, but I wasn't about to tell the detectives that unless I wanted to spend some time in a mental ward. The man I'd seen in the forest. It was me. I don't know why I bothered getting a new phone. I've been finding it so hard to concentrate lately I can barely hold down a conversation. My thoughts often start in one place and end up somewhere completely different to the point where I can't really even remember what I've been thinking of in the first place. The other day, I managed to land a phone interview for a pretty decent job, but halfway through the call, I lost track of my words so badly I actually forgot what the question was. I tried my best to recover, but it was too late. The woman thanked me for my time and got off the phone as quickly as she could. Not surprisingly, she didn't call back. I hate these phone interviews anyway. People half my intelligence judging me from a thousand miles away. They're lucky we're not in the same room, so I can't slap the clipboard out of their hands. Wait, what was I saying? The phone. I got a new phone with my first unemployment check. I told the kid at the store they should replace it for free, but he said I hadn't gone for the extra insurance, so I had to pay for a new one. This kid couldn't have been a day over 20, and he gets to bully me into spending a chunk of my unemployment on something I already bought. He wanted me to upgrade my contract, too, until I got loud with him. He dropped the sales pitch pretty quick after that. Damn it, I'm doing it again. The point is, someone keeps calling me and hanging up. At first, I thought it was a problem with the new phone, but... Then I called the number back and heard breathing on the other end. It wasn't lewd or anything. I don't know, it was more... panicked. Fearful. After listening to it a few seconds, I got pissed off and said, Hello? Who is this? There was a loud sound, like whoever it was slammed their phone down and then the line cut out. I haven't called back since, but... I'm still waiting. And it's not just the phone calls. Last night I was woken up by a knock on the door in the middle of the night. When I answered it, there was no one there. No one at my door, and no one in the hallway. I got to the door pretty quick, too. Quicker than it takes for the elevator to come up from the lobby. There's a stairwell they could have taken, I guess, but... The damn door squeaks so loudly, I definitely would have heard someone open it. So, either one of my neighbors knocked on my door at two in the morning, or the invisible man. I've called the police more than once, but they're no help. They came out to my apartment and took my statement about Andrews and the other fake detectives, but they didn't seem too convinced by my story. Whenever I ask about the attack that put me in the hospital, they say the case is pending further evidence which is a nice way of saying that it's closed. I won't give up, though. I called and I called until finally one officer said, Look, my guess is you got loaded on tranquilizers and hurt yourself. They are the people who are supposed to be protecting me. He said, I'm lucky no one pressed charges for the assault or property damage. I'm lucky. His words... My neighbor, Pete, the guy who visited me in the hospital, said a detective came around asking about me. I tried to explain that the person he talked to probably wasn't a real detective, but now the guy wants nothing to do with me. I even caught the woman across the hall staring, so I can only assume either word got around, 
Or the detective paid more than one visit in the building. As far as lawyers go, you can forget it. The only guys interested in my case are the kind of bottom scrapers and ambulance chasers I would never hire in the first place. I couldn't sleep last night. I got dressed and left the building to go for a walk. My thoughts were racing so badly, like two people arguing over each other, but the wind did feel good on my skin. And before I knew it, I was taking a booth at the Lighthouse Diner a couple of miles from my apartment. They know me well enough there to get a few head nods from the employees, but not so much that they know my name or what I do. Sometimes that's for the best. That they don't know my business and I don't know theirs. The waitress came over to take my order. No friends tonight? She said. Just me. I ordered a coffee and an omelet. I don't like eggs much, but I've been craving them lately. I've been craving a lot of weird things lately. The waitress put my order in and dropped off the coffee, leaving me to prepare it alone in the empty diner. As I poured the sugar in, I casually glanced over at my reflection in the mirrored wall across the aisle. I was not alone in the booth. The man seated across from me was immediately recognizable as Andrews, or whatever his actual name is, dressed in clothes that weren't trying to make him look like a detective. I understood right away that I wasn't seeing a ghost or anything like that. It was a memory. A slice of something forgotten coming through. The cuts and bruises on my face were gone, or well, rather not there yet. Even my clothes weren't the same, and I was struck with the fear that if I moved my head even slightly, the spell would be broken and the memory would be lost forever. I could see from my peripherals that no one was actually seated at the booth with me. The effect it had on my vision was completely disorienting. By the movement of his lips, the memory of Andrews was talking to the memory of me, though I couldn't really hear a word of it. The birthmark on his neck could be seen from my angle, as well as a yellow folder on the table between us. For a moment, the sound of the memory fluttered through my ears. Just five words of Andrew's voice. You have to go back. Overcome with curiosity and worried the memory would fade before I got any answers, I slowly, very slowly, turned my head to look down at the table, hoping that the folder would still be there. But there was only my coffee. A second later, my food arrived, further breaking the spell. I ate my eggs in silence, and when I was done, I asked for the bill. Before she left the table, I reached out and stopped the waitress. Quick question, I said. What did you mean, earlier? You said, no friends tonight? Oh, hey, I wasn't trying to be mean, she pouted in a friendly way. It's fine. I... Did you say that because the last time I came here I was with someone, maybe? Oh, the last few times, I think. Did you happen to catch his name? Or see it on his credit card? Anything like that? She shook her head. Well, he paid cash, if I remember. Why, did something happen? I waved the question off. <laughs> Nothing you would believe... She nodded, looking a bit weirded out. I paid the bill and headed home. This time, I really felt the distance. The night reminded me of the island, and the way the wind whistled in the treetops, making me feel hollow. By the time I got home, I was cold, drowsy, and tired of walking, but even still, when I laid down in bed to give sleep another shot, I could feel it wasn't going to happen anytime soon. After the first hour of lying awake in bed, I began to hear sounds. Whispers in the dark, but... Wet, 
like they were shaped from the sounds of maggots shifting. I jumped up, turned on the lights, and checked every corner of the apartment. There was nothing there. When I finally did fall asleep, I dreamt of being a kid again. I was back home with a living father and a mother who spoke to me. They were good dreams of holidays and playing and dinner time. But whenever I would turn my head, the house, the sky, everything was lit in a deep red light. This can't be real. I know this can't be real. Two days ago, I decided to leave town, this time for good. Too many people who couldn't be trusted knew where I lived. The way I figured it, you only get one life, so you'd better make it last as long as possible. If I had to wander the country, be homeless, or... or join the circus, or something, I... At least I'd be alive. There was nothing left for me back in town anyway. No friends, no family, no job. I might as well start over somewhere new, somewhere where nobody knows me. And just pray that my problems don't follow me there. I drove for as long as I could. There was no destination in mind, just west. Like the old pioneers. Except instead of fighting dysentery, I only had to stop every few hundred miles for gas. I drove until I could barely keep my eyes open, and the first time I nodded off, I picked out the cheapest motel I could find and checked in. A sickly girl with small teeth gave me a key and told me where to find the ice, though she didn't seem too convinced of it herself. My head barely touched the pillow before I was asleep. Except here's the thing. I fell asleep in a motel bed. That much, I know. But I woke up on the island. Sunlight danced in the leaves. It was a bright day, too bright for my eyes. As if they were adjusting to the light after walking out of a darkened theater, but it just wouldn't go away, no matter how long I waited. The sun was angry on my skin, and I felt about the light a way I've never felt before. It bothered me, hurt me. Right away I suspected I was dreaming, but it all felt just too real. The feel of the grass underfoot, the salty air that stung at my nostrils. Over to my left was the dock, but with no boat as usual, and behind me the main research building at the guard's office. As I studied them, dumbfounded, I noticed they were in perfect condition. The guard's office especially was intact. No busted down door or damage of any kind. And there were voices coming from inside. Slowly, I walked between the buildings to the side of the guard's office, giving distance to the windows, careful not to be seen, and pressed my ear to the wall. The voices were muted but familiar sounding, and I struggled to make out the words. A laugh, one I would know anywhere. It was Eric, the day guard. Eric, laughing. Eric, alive. Hearing him like that set something off in me, and I took my ear from the wall and headed toward the door. I'd like to say it was relief at hearing him alive, or some heroic need to warn him about his coming death, but... To be honest, more than anything, I just felt angry. A rage boiled up in my center as I took step after step through the grass. But before I could reach the door, it opened and someone stepped out into the daylight, closing the door behind them. Terry. I'd gone over this scenario in my head a thousand times. What I would do if I could get my hands on her. This psycho, this black widow. How I would enjoy making her pay for what she'd done to me and so many other unsuspecting men. I never thought I'd actually get that chance, considering she died back in that cave, but... These days, all things considered, that doesn't really seem to change anything. 
As I bore down on her, I said her name. Terry. Alive. Terry. Smiling. She looked up at me and I saw her eyes wash over with emotion. Fear and pain. And something else. Something wrong. And she glanced back at the office to check that the door was closed before she spoke. What are you doing here? Oh, looking for you? I replied, my throat hoarse. She looked again at the door. As I advanced on her, she didn't back down, didn't try to fight. She only stepped forward and said something I couldn't make out. In my mind, all I wanted to do was to grab her, to hit her, to choke her, and to shake the life from her. But the moment I reached out, hands going for her, my eyes went dark. Night. I stood on the dock listening to the ocean. It was an eternal sound that pulled at my gut, urging me to step off the wood and into the water. The coastline with its lights and sounds seemed the most foreign, most unnatural thing to me at that moment. There were closer lights, too. The guard's office was lit up like a torch in the night for the moths to bump and spiral against. Not just the outer security lights, but the ones inside the windows as well. But there was something more important I had noticed. Not a light, but a sound. Out in the trees past the buildings, the sound of a man walking through the woods. Quietly, trying not to give myself away, I left the docks behind and walked up the hill past the office. Past the bright window where inside the computer clicked and hummed. I tracked the sound in the trees through the first clearing. My god. The rotting bodies were back. Even the disappearing and reappearing woman. And halfway across the island, always keeping my distance in case my footsteps were too heavy. I felt clumsy in the dark, uncoordinated, and I didn't want to be heard by whoever it was I was trailing. Based on the direction they were going, I had a pretty good idea who it was. A few hundred yards from where the pretend detectives and I had searched for the elusive second cave entrance, I doubled my pace without care for the noise. I'd be damned if I lost the bastard now. Yet, damned I apparently was. Because as I came to where the entrance should have been, I found myself very much alone in the clearing, staring out at ivy and leaves soaked in the dew. I didn't see much choice except to wait. So I dug myself in behind an elm and watched carefully for anything unusual any sight or sound to go on. It took less than five minutes. With no warning, a patch of thick, thick ivy swung up from the ground less than twenty feet from where I crouched. The ivy was mounted to a buried door, the wood made up to look like dirt, the whole thing so dirty and ivy-tangled we'd missed it on every pass. Dr. Christensen rose up from the ground. He calmly climbed an unseen ladder, then stepped up from the depths and onto the ground. He shut the door behind him and tossed something into the tall grass, stomping back into the woods. I waited until he was gone, then scrambled for it and checked what he'd thrown. A mostly empty bottle of whiskey, the remains dribbling into the dirt. I left it and pushed my hands into the wet ivy, searched around until my fingers found a handle. The hidden door lifted so easily, and once it was propped open on its rusted hinge, I clambered down the hole beneath, feet slipping on the cold metal rungs of the ladder that led down into the ground. The sea echoed against the rock, and there was just enough light for me to stumble my way through the cave. It wasn't the moon, or a candle, or a flashlight that guided me, but the blinking, cycling lights of machines working in the dark that drew me in. One or two had small monitors, but 
Most of them were of an older style, with dials and diodes and paper-fed readouts, and a crowd of other things I have never seen outside of a black and white movie. One of the screens showed a topographic lineup of land which could only be Twain Island, with small bulbs inserted into key points. One of them was lit up and buzzing, and if I had to guess, I would put its location somewhere close to where Greg's body was. Greg, that guy with the arms. As I got closer to the busy machines, one of them, the largest, clicked on as if responding to company, and a large, thick glass bulb at its top, one that reminded me of the lamp and lens at the top of a lighthouse, hummed to life. The filament inside glowed hot, then hotter, and somewhere, paper feed began spitting out lengths. The glass was red, and so was the light. The sight of it sucked me in even stronger than the ocean had not long before. I reached out for it, reached for the expanding glow, walked toward the welcoming, luminescent red, and in the throbbing crimson light, I could see there was something wrong with my hand near the thumb, something that didn't belong there. And as all became the dark warmth of red sun, I made out the faint patterns of black thread stitched into my skin. I woke up in the morning, in my car, pulled over at a harsh angle on the side of the road. Whether I'd stayed in a motel or not, I couldn't say, but there was enough cash missing from my wallet that I think that I did. These days, it's so hard to keep track of everything. Every little thing. It's bad enough keeping track of where I am, let alone where I've been. Back on the island, when I reached for Terry, she'd said something I couldn't hear. I spent a lot of time since thinking about her lips, the way they moved, the words that they'd formed, the three words she'd said. I think I may know what they are now. Your not finished. The last days before I left town, I started having blackouts, long periods of time I lost track of. My car wouldn't be where I parked it. Food would be gone from my refrigerator. Before I left, I made one last stop. I drove to the employment agency who put me on the damned island in the first place. I wanted to question the little prick who ran it. I needed to know if he had been in on it, if he'd knowingly sent me and God knows how many others into the snake pit, or if he'd been as naive as I was. But when I got there, all I found was the charred remains of a building. What was left of it was marked off with police tape. Someone had burnt it to the ground. Quiet days at the bank are nice sometimes, but they do have a tendency to drag unless I keep busy. That's really why I started writing stories in the first place. They're my little distractions from the silence and the other things I'd rather not think about. So I was at my desk, taking advantage of the quiet by catching up on some paperwork when very suddenly I had this, this powerful feeling this realization that what was happening, all of this, was wrong. It began to sink in that I shouldn't be there, that I hadn't worked there in weeks and more disturbingly couldn't remember how I'd gotten there. Was it all a dream? And if so, had I finally woken up? Hey! I tried to flag down a passing customer, but she didn't answer. She kept walking as if she hadn't heard me, and in fact, no one was paying attention to me or doing anything but staring ahead or down at their work. I wanted to get a look at the date to get some kind of explanation for all this, but I, I couldn't get my computer monitor to turn on. I banged on the keyboard and clicked the mouse, but nothing happened. Unresponsive. 
I gave the tower under my desk a hard kick, and then the screen clicked on and began to buzz to life. Instead of the desktop, though, the screen was pure white. And then it changed, becoming pink at first, and then darkening to a deep red. And it was bright, almost blinding. And I tried to click the mouse again, only to find that there was no mouse and no keyboard under my hands. There wasn't even a tower, the one I had just kicked. I wheeled back from my desk with my hands in front of my eyes to shield them from the sting of the red light. It became so strong that it filled the entire bank, ceiling, walls, and floor, from the desk cubicles to the teller window to the lobby at the far end, yet no one reacted in the slightest. They continued their work and went about their day, bathed in the light, oblivious to the blood color wrapping their eyes. Up out of my chair, I went to Carol, one of my co-workers, and called her name. She didn't look up. I did the same to Vince, and when he didn't respond to the name, I repeated it louder. It was like talking into the wind. The sound of his name was sucked up into this vacuum. I went from desk to desk, banged on the security glass of the teller window, and shouted as loud as I could from the center of the bank. Nothing was heard, nothing was seen. Time had drained from the room, and I knew then I needed to escape before I drained down with it. The door. I ran through the lobby and out the door, needing to be free of that place. When I burst out of the building, I expected to find the same gray parking lot I'd come out to hundreds of times before. The flat stretch of cracked concrete broken by tall lights every twenty spaces. But instead, I came out to a blur of brown and green and blue. When I stopped myself, there was the sound of seagulls and crashing waves. I was on the island again. I turned around to look back at the bank, but it was already gone. The entire six-story building vanished like it had never been there. My chest seized up with a choking helplessness as I realized there was no way off this island. That no matter how fast I ran, or how far I drove, the moment I turned my head, it could all come crashing back. A chunk of rock surrounded by sea was always there, ready to squeeze me between cold fingers. It was time to focus. Time to go home. Where was I on the island? Somewhere near the cave, as far as I could tell, but it was hard to be sure without landmarks. It was daytime, but the woods all looked the same. I took my best guess at the direction of the dock and started off. Amazed at how many times now I had taken this walk, I'd sworn that I'd never take. Not two minutes later, I heard a shout from far behind me. It was a man's voice telling me to stop. Without a second thought, or even a first, I ran. I ran like hell and I didn't stop running, no matter how much the unseen man ordered me to until I spotted a thick grouping of trees up ahead and made a line for it, aiming for the small space between two large elms. I ran so fast I didn't feel my feet touch the dirt. The trees came up quickly, and I ran between the two elms, hoping to lose what now sounded like three or even four men chasing me through the woods. I came out the other side in... in a long hallway, echoing with some high-pitched sound. Going from outdoors to indoors with no transition at all was jarring, though. I knew right away where I was. It was the main research building. The laboratories on the left and on the right were the cleaning and packing rooms I knew too well. There was no need to turn around. I knew that the woods would be gone. My ears adjusted to the echoes... The high-pitched sound was a woman crying. It was coming from the packing room at the end of the hall. And as much as I didn't want to go any closer, I was compelled to seek it out. Maybe the voice sounded familiar. It wasn't Terry's. It was someone older. And they sounded like they were in pain. So I went forward. 
went toward the familiar and the painful. When I turned the corner, I'd expected to find the woman, but all I found was the packing room. Empty, except for the boxes, stacks of bones and skulls. Yet the crying continued. The woman in pain, her voice, it, it formed wordless cries for help, painful and destroyed, reaching out for compassion. As I walked into the room, it grew louder, closer, and it became obvious that the cries were coming from one of the boxes sitting on the work desk. It was sealed with tape. I could swear I could see it shaking. And I knew whose voice it was. The woman. I backed away and I left her there, shutting the door behind me to muffle the cries. On my way back up the hallway and toward the exit, I peeked into the laboratory on my right and caught sight of a familiar scene. Familiar, yet different. Three men in lab coats unwrapped a new corpse laid out on the metal slab, pulling a man's head free and peeling black plastic away from crusted skin. I stopped heading for the exit and approached the door, placed my palms on its window, and watched the men work. It was like seeing some moment from a future time echoing a moment from the past. I could only see the back of the laboratory men, but one of them had a birthmark on his neck just behind his ear. When I looked again at the corpse they were unwrapping, I found its eyes were open and staring at me. It was Bernard. He was dead, drained of blood, and yet I could still feel his hatred for me. His accusing eyes stayed unblinking on me as I turned away and left. Standing in the guard's office, all of it pristine and unbroken except for the two-way radio which wouldn't pick up a signal, I found I didn't know where to go anymore. Where to run. I was at a crossroads. And then I remembered. My phone was in my pocket. There'd been no boat launch to turn it in. I'd come straight from the bank where my phone was always on me. I fumbled it out of my pocket and tried calling the cops first. It rang and rang without answer. I hung up. I tried calling the first number in my contacts. No answer. I dialed seven random numbers and I waited ten rings before giving up. Just as I was about to put my phone away, it rang in my hand. I answered it and brought it to my ear. My breathing was heavy, panicked, and as much as I tried to speak, my throat was too tight to let the words out. After a few seconds, an annoyed voice on the other end said, Hello? Who is this? Cold fear spread through me. The phone fell from my stiff hand and hit the floor, breaking into a million shards of glass and plastic that danced across the floor. The connection was lost. Acid burned in my throat and my stomach felt ready to spill. I looked toward the bathroom but had to look again and I saw the door had changed. The location was the same, but the type was entirely different. No longer a bathroom door, but the door to an apartment. It even had a number plate screwed to it at eye level. Apartment 403. My apartment. With my hand shaking, I tried the handle but found it was locked. I checked my pocket for keys and came up empty. So I knocked. I knocked on my own door, not knowing what to expect, if it would swing open and I would find myself face to face with myself or maybe someone else completely living in my apartment, taking over my things. At this point, nothing would surprise me. 
I waited a second. My hand hovered as I considered knocking again. I decided not to. As I looked around at the office, trying to figure out where to go from there, if I should maybe risk jumping in the rough ocean and making a swim for shore, I heard the unmistakable sound of the door shutting behind me. I swung around to see what had opened it, but it was only a closed door. Not my door. Not apartment 403. It was only a bathroom door. I opened it, unlocked now, and looked inside to find the bathroom and nothing else. I don't know where I am anymore. I'm not even sure I'm really writing this. I feel so lost. Exposed. Like a hermit crab pulled from its shell. Some part of me is fading fast and... I'm afraid the next time I close my eyes, the next time I blink, it will be for good. I'm so sorry, Mom. I'm sorry about Dad. You told me. You told me that I would answer for my sins. You are right. They didn't bury their treasure here. They buried their dead. I was woken by a gunshot. The rough sounds of scuffles in the dark reverberated in my skull. It took a long time. Too long to draw enough energy to open my eyes. and Twice as long to sit up. But... Finally, my feet dangled from the slab. The contraption around my chest glowed faint red at its center and grew brighter each time I moved. My body was difficult to control. The skin felt twisted over bones, like I had slept in a suit one size too small. The first time I stood up, I fell down, hit the stone floor hard. But I stood up, steadied myself on an instrument table and eventually took my first step, followed by another, and then another. The stone was cold, damp under my naked feet. The cave was lit up by lanterns and the excited readouts of machines, all those computers cooling down from their purposes. However long I thought it had taken to open my eyes, my perception of time had been wrong. It seemed that I was completely alone inside the cave. The fight had moved elsewhere. Halfway across the cave, I found my sister. She lay in a ditch of wet rock like a lost doll. I fell on her, wiped the foam from her mouth to check her breathing. It was faint. The same for the pulse in her neck. There was a needle mark, droplet of blood had beat it up. Before I could try to resuscitate her, her eyes fluttered open. She smiled at me. Who did this to you? My voice. It felt so strange coming out of my throat. Your eyes. She was raspy, strained. It was as difficult for her to talk as it was for me to watch her try. Who was it? Duck. The word cut out as she winced in pain. Whatever he had used on her was tearing her insides apart. I told her I could get her help, but she shook her head. Too far. Won't make it. Just promise. Of course. Of course I will. She smiled again. So nice to see your eyes. Suddenly, her smile twisted and she began spasming underneath me. Her body bounced violently up and down, arms and legs slapping hard rock, and I tried my best to hold her still. 
keep her from hurting herself. My body weight pressed down on her, but soon the spasm stopped. Her eyes lost focus. She exhaled one final, small breath. Right there in my hands, my sister died. I allowed myself a moment before my thoughts turned to the good doctor. The man who had promised to give me my life back and ended up taking it all from me. As I pictured his face, I became aware of the cave around me growing brighter. The body of another guard now visible, the ocean water where it entered the cave, all of it cast in blood red. The machine on my chest, it fed on my anger. The hotter I burned, the hotter it did, until the cave was like the head of a struck match. As fast as my remembering limbs would take me, I climbed the ladder and exited the cave. Emerging into the dark woods which had been my home for far too long. Before I left, I shut the door behind me and made sure it was properly concealed by the plants and ivy and other things that grew there. Like a searing flame, I crossed the island. The old trees lit up in my presence. I ignored everything except my destination. Even as I came alive with fresh senses, I thought of only one thing. One man. And like the coward he was, I knew I would find him near the dock, trying to escape the consequences he deserved. Not twenty yards from the buildings near the dock, I heard his wretched voice. I did not say twenty minutes, I said thirty. Through the trees I could see him, standing in the clearing, arguing with the man on the phone. You can justify it however you want, but if your brother isn't pulling up to this dock in thirty minutes, it will be your head. Do you understand me? He had been stabbed, the back of his coat slick with blood. I hoped it was my sister who'd done the deed, but I had the faint memory of it in the back of my mind, as if I had done it myself. I waited for him to hang up the phone before I stepped out from the trees. The sound of my foot breaking a twig caught his attention, and his hand tensed around his gun. He relaxed when he saw it was me, as if I didn't pose a threat. Get back to the lab, he ordered, like I was his dog. I saw what you did to her. The doctor's face tensed up as he reevaluated my presence. It was unavoidable, he concluded. Now, Will you help me with him so we can finish this? He looked over to the small guard building, through the door which seemed to be blocked from the inside. There. He sees me, the doctor said. Now is the time. If I help you with him, you help me with her? He looked back at me. You're mad. Yes. <laughs> yes, I am. I walked slowly toward the doctor, and for the first time since I met him, fear crossed his eyes. I told you that it was unavoidable. Even if I wanted to, there isn't enough time to bring her back. As he babbled and fumbled over his words, I took hold of the metal contraption wrapped around my chest and began to pull it from my skin. I ignored the pain of the needles and wires ripping free. Now, now just hold, hold on. If the body doesn't give up on the old spirit so easily, you're, you're still only half in this world. I tore the remainder of the machine off my body and advanced on him wielding it above my head as a weapon. 
He stepped back and tripped over a large root, falling on his back. Help me, I said. Of course, he replied. He raised his gun and fired. The bullet screamed past my ear. The rage exploded in my chest as I began to bludgeon him with his own device. There's no work to be done! He screamed, firing again, but I could barely hear him. My ears had gone deaf. Not wanting to break the contraption, I threw it aside and choked him with my hands, and even as the bulb dimmed, all was red in the night. With my lungs burning, I left him there and began working on the office door, beating against it with my hands and body. A shout came from inside the small building. I beat on it harder until the wood cracked, and after a minute, I pushed it the rest of the way open. A stitched together man stood frantically typing at the computer. He wore guards' clothes and the parts of a dozen different corpses, a suit which had recently belonged to me. The patchwork man looked at me, right at my face and a look of familiarity filled his eyes, followed by horror. What? He exclaimed. He looked down at his hands, turned them over to see the black thread holding them together. No. You can't. Using his disorientation against him, I attacked the patchwork man. We fought brutally, each of us laying claim over the same earthly body, and at times I saw the struggle from his eyes. And at times, I could feel him seeing it through mine. But his weak, assembled body was no match for mine. He managed to bruise and cut my new face, but in the end... I was the one left standing. As his mismatched eyes grayed over, I read the screen to see what he'd been so passionately typing. Listen, I'm writing this because I have no phone and no one to email. My father is dead and my mother might as well be. I have no friends and no one to help me. Don't come out here. I'll update tomorrow. I'll be okay. I'll think of something. God, just don't come out here. Before I sign off, I have something to confess. I wasn't just hired to be a guard. That was how it started, but then it became something more. These men approached me and said the doctor was conducting secret studies on the island. They said he discovered the soul. The man with the birthmark, he told me the doctor made a breakthrough in something called spirit retrieval. That they wanted me to spy on him, to get it for themselves, or they'd tell people what I did that I was responsible for my father's death. I didn't believe it at first, but now I think the island is some kind of focal point. Stealing the body parts was just phase one. Once they get the spirit into the body, it can be transferred into someone whole. Someone alive. That red glow out there. Whatever killed the doctor. I think it's the brother. And I think I know what he wants. If I make it off this island, that is, if my body makes it to shore, it might not be just me inside of it. Whatever you do, <laughs> don't trust me. With one bloody finger, I held down the backspace key until I was satisfied, and then I hit send. 
I stripped the patchwork man of his uniform and put it on myself, and dragged his body into the woods to join the others. Let the sniveling men deal with it. The men who sniffed and pried and stole for themselves. Like so many of the maggots I'd come to know. As I stood at the end of the dock to wait for the boat, the sting of the wind on my damaged body, I could feel the guard inside fighting me, the patchwork man struggling to take his life back. He didn't understand the futility of his fight for the simple reason that I wanted it more. His life, his vessel, and would do more to keep it. It was that simple. I would pull his strings until it was time to cut them. Oh, you won't hear from me after today. You'll never see me again. I will not tell you where I am or where I'm going. And this is my final transmission. But one day... I will come back for her. I swear it. Thanks for joining us again tonight at the Horror Hill. You've been listening to Part 2 and the conclusion of The Body Farm by Brian Martinez. Brian Martinez is the author of more than a dozen works in the science fiction and horror genres, starting with his apocalyptic debut, A Chemical Fire, a deeply personal blend of loss, science, faith, and humor. A Chemical Fire established many common themes in Martinez's writing. As a participant in Nano Rimo, he wrote the bizarre tale, Kissing You is Like Trying to Punch a Ghost, before returning to the apocalypse with his serialized saga, The Mountain and the City. Intense yet poignant, The Mountain and the City has been praised by several horror writers, including DJ Moles, author of The Remaining, who labeled it a future bestseller. Martinez has also penned three installments in his dark urban fantasy series, The Obscured as well as one Kindle World's title for Nicholas Sandsbury Smith's Extinction Cycle. His current project, The Vessel, is an ongoing space horror serial, which has been compared to a mixture between Dead Space and the island of Dr. Moreau. Martinez studied film at Long Island University, where his short films played at the annual festivals. His works have appeared on screen and in print, and have been adapted to audio for YouTube, podcast, and audiobook listeners. He lives on Long Island, New York, with his wife Natalia and their pack of wild dogs. For more information, please visit his website at bloodstreamcity.com and sign up for his mailing list to receive free stories and news of future releases. Thanks for listening. You've been listening to Horror Hill, a production of Chilling Entertainment and the creative team at Chilling Tales for Dark Nights, and a proud member of the Simply Scary Podcast Network. Visit simplyscarypodcast.com today to learn more about our network and our other amazing storytelling programs. Tonight's program was hosted, and its featured stories performed by yours truly, Jason Hill. Additional performers have been featured when necessary to bring the tales to life. Selected stories have been adapted with the kind permission of their respected authors. Sound design, original music, and final mixing and mastering provided by Luke Hodgkinson under the guidance of executive producer and director Craig Groshek. The program's artwork and logo by Jason Hill. Got a scary tale of your own that you'd like performed? I take submissions. Email it to me today at horrorhill at simplyscarypodcast.com 
to have your terrifying tome considered for production in a future episode of the show. If you enjoyed what you heard on tonight's program and are joining us on your favorite podcast app, subscribe to us to be sure that you never miss an episode. And please, leave us a five-star review and a comment. Your feedback means a lot to me. You can also follow Chilling Tales for Dark Nights and Horror Hill on Facebook to connect anytime and get the latest updates. If you're listening on the Chilling Tales for Dark Nights YouTube channel, do us a favor and hit the subscribe button and the bell notification icon to get more spooky tales from me and the crew and another episode of this program each and every Thursday. And don't forget to hit that thumbs up button too to tell us how we're doing. Oh, and if you could, please leave a kind word or even a request. If you can never get enough spooky stories and can't wait until next week for more, and haven't already, be sure to check out Chilling Tales for Dark Nights on YouTube for more than 500 free audio horror stories, including more performance from yours truly, and consider supporting the team by becoming a patron. In addition to helping us out, you'll get exclusive access to our audio archive and ad-free downloads of all your favorite stories, including those you've heard on this program. As for me, I'll be back next Thursday with more frightening fiction to haunt your dreams. Until next time, this is Jason Hill. Good evening.